ahead, please. Kung Yode? Am I audible? Yes, you are. We can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yes, Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, you for this morning. Thank you for the class. Um, I pray that you would uh, help of us, God, to be attentive and uh, yeah, and to uh, pay attention to what has been taught, God. Um, give Pastor a typical wisdom and knowledge, God, as she uh, teaches us, God. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Kung. All right. We will get into our lesson. Uh, we will uh, cover all of John chapter 12, but we'll probably be able to cover only half of John chapter 13. Uh, so that's the goal for today. Uh, so let's you know start off right away uh, by looking into John chapter 12. Uh, we could maybe begin with the first three verses, uh, which serve like an introduction for this next main section of John. Because from now on, um, it's all going to be about uh, the crucifixion. Everything that takes place will point towards Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, so um, if we could begin by reading out verses 1, 2, and 3. Could someone read out, please? John 12, verses 1, 2, 3. Uh, don't tell me no one has the Bible open. John chapter 12. Go ahead. John 12, 1. Um, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who, uh, who had died, sorry, where Lazarus, who had uh, been dead, whom he had risen from the dead. There they had made, uh, they had made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of uh, very costly oil of uh, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. All right. So um, here we have uh, Jesus being honored at a meal. And uh, when we look at the Mark and Matthew Gospels, we learn that this particular meal is being taken um, care of by Simon the leper. So it's basically at his home that they are having this event. And um, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are also present at the uh, lunch. And uh, Jesus is being honored. Uh, it was a general custom in those days uh, to you know, invite teachers to come and teach. And whichever home he is staying at, uh, they would, you know, throw a meal for everyone who will be attending. And um, uh, the, the teacher who is visiting will sit down and teach the crowd. That's basically how it was done. But I think over here in this particular case, uh, he's being invited not just to teach, but also because uh, of the incident which has just taken place a little earlier. And um, everyone is amazed at uh, a person being raised to life after, um, you know, being inside uh, the grave for so long. And so uh, here Jesus is being honored for that occasion. And um, uh, so we see a large crowd, um, you know, gathering here. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming that a lot of people would have come uh, because of this miracle that has taken place. Now, uh, it says over here that um, uh, Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. So um, the term rec reclining is used over here because, uh, you know, back in those times, um, most of the meals would be, um, you know, eaten on the floor. Uh, they would just sit on the floor on carpets uh, rather than having uh, chairs and tables. 
they would uh, in fact sit on carpets and there would be a low table in front of them on which the food would be placed uh, so um, generally i suppose they would sit sideways you know so that um, they can lean on the you know they can put one elbow on the table kind of lean against it and uh, so you would basically have the feet uh, pointing away from the table you know out into the open at the back uh, so they would generally place an elbow on uh, the table uh, and and then eat uh, so uh, that's basically how they would have eaten in those days so uh, which makes it easy for you know anyone who wants to do any feet washing um, you know a ritual uh, they would be able to do that because uh, the guests would be facing towards the table. Um, uh, they would be uh, resting their elbow on the table and their feet would be uh, kind of away from the table. So um, that's the position uh, in which these um, guests are all seated at the table. And uh, Mary comes over there and it says that she uh, breaks open a very expensive perfume and um, uh, she wipes his feet. Um, now, um, it was customary to um, when 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 important guests would come to the house, uh, not only would uh, they make arrangements for that person's feet to be washed, uh, they would also um, you know anoint the head with a small dab of oil or perfume or, or something as a, as a sign of respect and honor. And uh, so over here, you have Mary doing that. She is washing his feet and she is anointing him with perfume. Only thing what she is doing is um, very lavish uh, in the sense uh, the perfume that she is now uh, breaking open uh, would have been the wages of a person who has worked an entire year to earn so it's not something um, inexpensive what she is doing is rather overboard you know is what we would say uh, so um, uh, it would have cost it would have uh, yeah a person would have had to work an entire year to be able to afford uh, to purchase something like that so obviously this is some one of their um, what financial investments you know of Lazarus and his family um, they probably would have um, you know invested in it uh, and kept it with them in the hope that someday when there are hard times or something they can sell it in the market and you know get money uh, so that's the reason um, you know people even buy gold today not because they want to wear all the gold which they have bought uh, but they may mainly buy gold as an investment uh, because they can store it easily and in a time of need you can always you know sell off the gold and uh, uh, use that money for different purposes so uh, here is something that they have invested in as a family and kept with them for a long time and now most generously uh, you know uh, they are uh, expending it upon jesus to honor him and uh, so it's a very great it's the ultimate honor which you know mary and her family could give to jesus and they are doing it uh, most willingly uh, and um, a lot of confusion is there regarding this passage because we have another similar passage being mentioned by Luke, um, which would be Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. And uh, because the, uh, the, uh, the lady in that other story is a prostitute, now, there's a lot of confusion and people wonder whether this Mary, May, you know, Lazarus' sister, Mary of Bethany, whether she also was a prostitute. Uh, but then uh, we kind of need to see that these are two different events. OK, so um, what Lazarus' sister Mary does for Jesus, uh, that's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and John. On the other hand, the story that we see in Luke uh, talks about a different person um, who honors in a similar manner, uh, but um, the occasion is completely different because uh, this is taking place very clearly in Bethany, you know, where Lazarus and his sisters live. So uh, in Bethany, in Judea is where this event is taking place. On the other hand, the Luke event, uh, uh, which is in Luke chapter 7, uh, that takes place in Galilee. And they are uh, two completely different places. Now, uh, also, we observe that over here, when uh, um, Mary does this act of honor for Jesus, um, Judas Iscariot is very, you know, um, 
offended that the money is getting uh, wasted. He feels that the money is being wasted on Jesus. And uh, so he um, protests. But then in the other story that we see in Luke, um, it is uh, the, a, a, someone named Simon the Pharisee. He is the one who protests. Uh, he thinks in his mind, uh, you know, Jesus is not aware of who is touching him and is allowing a prostitute uh, to be at his feet. Uh, and so um, over, you see two different uh, forms of uh, protest being mentioned in these two stories. Also, another important thing that we observe is that the other incident, the Luke incident, takes place somewhere around the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But over here, this incident, where Mary is honoring Jesus, that's clearly happening at the end of Jesus' ministry because he says, you know, um, without realizing it, she has prepared me for my uh, death and burial, is what Jesus says. So this is taking place at the end of Jesus' ministry. And um, um, yeah, I think so those would be the main, um, you know, uh, differences that we can make. Uh, regarding these two passages. So very clearly, there are two different stories. Uh, Luke is talking about a prostitute who was probably you know, forgiven by the Lord. And um, out of her repentance and gratitude, uh, she performs an act of honor. Uh, but that is a different incident. And over here, we have Mary of Bethany uh, doing something similar for the Lord. And over here, Jesus says, this is being done for me in preparation for my burial. Um, so we'll just come uh, and you know uh, come to Judas' response. Uh, we will uh, look at that uh, a little. Uh, so if maybe we could have one person read out uh, verses four, five, and six, please. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Yes. So um, we see two kinds of people here. On the other hand, on the one hand, you have Mary and her uh, family so full of gratitude and uh, wanting to give their very best i mean the, the most expensive thing that they had in their home they come and they you know place it before him uh, so they are so grateful to the lord on the other hand you have a person who has been uh, literally living with jesus for three years um, we've been interacting with him has experienced his love his forgiveness his patience has experienced all of that and in his heart there is nothing you know, so there's such a contrast between um, Mary's love and devotion and uh, the attitude of Judas. Uh, so um, we also observe that um, nobody protests or says anything when Judas talks about how the um, you know uh, money should have been given to the poor. Uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus says the poor will always be with you, but you know this is something that uh, she has done. Uh, for my burial. So uh, nobody uh, stands up and says, uh, oh no, you're a hypocrite, you don't really care for the poor, because they all assume that Judas is a good and godly man. Um, he's been with the disciples uh, for all of these three years. And uh, so they assume that just like all the other disciples who love the Lord and who are uh, you know, looking towards the future kingdom and all of that, they assume that Judas also is something like that and uh, so when he makes his protest and says oh my all this could have been given to the poor you know the poor people who have nothing with them uh, and they so they don't they probably think in their minds that he is being genuine in his concern towards the poor uh, no one really realizes uh, what his true nature is um, and uh, one point which the scholars make i mean probably is a valid point they uh, say that generally the work of treasurer is given to someone that uh, you know you trust completely. We generally don't hand over our financial management to someone who cannot really be trusted, right? Uh, so, so probably uh, Judas was considered as someone very trustworthy, uh, someone with a high level of integrity, and uh, this is what this man actually is like on the inside. Um, so. Um, 
this is something that uh, we need to be careful about you know even in our personal lives in our ministry um, just because a person um, acts very good on the outside uh, it need not be that they are good on the inside uh, which is where the you know uh, the gift of discernment comes in um, so when i mean if you are a leader in your church and you're going to be appointing uh, people into positions of responsibility of course we would want people who have a good testimony uh, people who you know um, are involved in in uh, good and godly acts and actions uh, but at the same time uh, you know just like they did in the early church uh, before appointing anyone um, it's good to you know gather in prayer and wait upon the lord uh, because then the lord maybe can help us discern uh, whether um, uh, those people who are doing good actions on the outside are also good and faithful on the inside it's something that the lord would know and uh, he would reveal that to us if we you know uh, spend time in prayer before appointing people to their positions uh, however over here in this case um, you know we we see that later in the next chapter uh, it's very clearly told over there that jesus was aware that judas was crooked on the inside and knowing that in spite of knowing that um, uh, jesus chooses to appoint him um we'll we'll get to that later in the next chapter uh, so uh, moving on from there uh, we could maybe look at verses um 12 to 6 12 to 15 if someone could read out verses 12 to 15 please The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that jesus was coming to jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord the king of israel then jesus when he had found a young donkey sat on it as it is written fear not daughter of zion behold your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt yes so uh, uh during the passover uh, they would always sing uh, the psalms 113 to 118 and uh, the wording that is being um, you know used over here that's part of psalm 118 25 to 26 uh, where you have the wording hoshiana okay so um, 113 to 118 those psalms were called the halel and they were sung at every single passover feast uh, the last chapter 118 in the verses 25 to 26 um, you, these are the words that we have if maybe someone could actually turn to that psalm 118 verses 25 to 26 Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is you comes the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. All right, so here it um, does not just say Hosanna. It says, Lord, save us. In some versions, it says, Lord, save now. Um, because that word Hoshiana literally means Hoshia is, um, is to save and uh, na is you know now so uh, save now is this literal meaning of that um so later on this word hosanna turned into a word of praise uh, but uh, literally translating we would say that it means save now uh, so later that turned into a word of praise because um, it's like as if the people are saying even as we are crying out save now we know that you are indeed going to save so um, uh, it, it, it kind of turned into a declaration that we will be saved, you know. So, uh, but otherwise, it actually originally the wording means save now. Okay, so um, 
the people are uh, specifying this last portion of this halal which was always sung because they are uh, now very very sure that this person who can raise people from the dead he definitely must be the messiah whom they have been waiting for and he is going to come and save their land you know save their um, their nation from foreign rule so they are rather happy about it and so they are crying out you know save now you know redeem us now from these people from this foreign uh, rulers and uh, so uh, they are they are looking towards um towards political salvation on the other hand um it, it says over here um jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written you know, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So over here, um, uh, if we look at this uh, in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 10, uh, we, we see that uh, something else is being expressed regarding Jesus you know, regarding the king who is coming seated on a donkey. So maybe we could actually look at Zechariah 9, 9 to 10, and then we'll kind of, you know, figure out uh, what exactly is going on over here. Zechariah 9, 9 to 10, if we could have someone read out, please. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king comes unto thee, he is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the fall of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the nation, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth okay so over so, here if we look in zechariah chapter 9 um, the entire context is about how there has been a lot of warfare and strife and the nation has gone through difficult times but it's talking about a day uh, which will come when the king when he comes he will not come on a war horse in fact it says in uh, zechariah 9 verse 10 all the war horses and the chariots will be removed from Jerusalem because they will no longer be needed. There will no longer be any warfare of any kind um, uh, because he will, it says in uh, verse 10, he will proclaim peace to the nations. Okay, so um, that is being symbolized over here. Jesus is coming not to wage war at all. Rather, he is coming to proclaim peace. Uh, so, um, of course, in Zechariah 9, it is talking about the end times, you know, when uh, um, when indeed there would be uh, peace restored and there would no longer be any war. Uh, but over here, Jesus is not coming to wage war with humans and he's coming over here to wage war with the uh, evil forces which have bound people in sin uh, and, and, you know, leading to death and all of that. Uh, so here he is not coming in, in uh, war against people. And so he specifically chooses, it says in verse 14 uh, of our John 12, it says, Jesus found the young donkey and sat on it. Uh, so he deliberately chooses this particular mode of transport uh, because he's making a, um, he's, he's trying to convey something. And you know, when we look in verse 16, it says that the disciples did not quite understand this at that time. Then later on, they understand the significance of uh, what has been done. Uh, so the people are crying out and saying, save now when they are uh, getting ready for a war. They want a war. Um, on the other hand, Jesus is not coming to wage any kind of war. Uh, he is um, looking ahead to a day when there will no longer be any kind of warfare. Uh, when in fact all war horses would be removed from Jerusalem because there's no need for it for them any longer. So Jesus comes on a donkey's colt uh, because he wants to uh, proclaim peace. Um, over here in this particular case, uh, peace at a physical level in the future, in the end times, and peace right now at a spiritual level with the Lord because God will no longer be angry against people, no longer judge them but he will be uh, willing to uh, enter into a peaceful covenant with them 
through Jesus. So Jesus comes over here on a colt uh, to, to bring out these two aspects of peace. You know, so uh, what the crowd is waiting for, what the crowd is looking for is not something that Jesus has in mind at all at this particular time. OK, so um, moving on to verses uh, maybe 20, 21 and uh, OK. Uh, maybe we could have verses 20 to 23. If someone could read out, please, uh, 20 to 23. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So this came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. All right. So um, uh, we have the crowds very excited. They have a wrong impression about why Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And so they're all crying out very loudly assuming that now they're going to be liberated from the Romans very, very soon. And um, uh, in verse 19, uh, we see that the Pharisees are very worried about their position. So they say, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So the main concern is that this is getting us nowhere. We are not. We have not achieved anything in all our conspiracies against Jesus. People are still following him. Crowds are going after him. We are going to lose our position. And so they are rather concerned about it. And then in verse 20, you have these Greeks coming over there. They have come to you know, for, the, um, for the festival, uh, which means they are Greek people who have placed their faith in Yahweh. Uh, these are Greek people uh, who have forsaken their Greek gods. And uh, now they have come over here to the Passover festival to offer their sacrifices because they are, um, they are what, um, Greek converts, you know, because uh, uh, the Jewish people, uh, they were engaged to a small extent in some kind of mission work where they were talking about Yahweh. So um, we see that, right? Um, even uh, in Babylon and Egypt and all where they had gone, the people who had settled down over there, uh, they were talking about their faith. They were talking about Yahweh. And there were some people who responded. And uh, they had given up their uh, you know, a pagan worship. And they had uh, now become followers of Yahweh. So many of these people also would uh, sometimes come for these uh, major main feasts. They would travel all the way to Jerusalem uh, because, and they were uh, what were called the proselytizers. You know, they were um, um, they were converts uh, to the faith uh, of Yahweh, and they have come from other backgrounds. So these Greeks are probably belong to that particular category. And so now that they hear about Jesus and what He has done, uh, they are eager to meet with Him. They are eager to learn more. And uh, so on the one side in verse 19, you have Pharisees who are only concerned about their position. And they, uh, and they even though they've been you know, literally rubbing shoulders with Jesus and been interacting with Him, talking to Him, having discussions with Him, it's not had any impact on them. On the other hand, you have these Greeks who have come all the way from somewhere uh, and, uh, you know, from another city. And um, they uh, seem to be so eager to find out more, to learn more. And uh, when they express their desire to, to talk to him, this is Jesus' immediate response. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Um, why? Why was this the moment? And Jesus says, OK, all this while, you know, I've been saying my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. And now when these Greeks come over here, why does he suddenly say, now is the time. Now the time has come and the Son of Man will be glorified. Um, I think it's because um, Jesus had been saying, you know, earlier, uh, my true sheep will hear my voice. So uh, all the fake sheep people like the Pharisees, even though they had been so clearly told, along with examples and evidence, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. They had rejected him. And Jesus had said, my true sheep, when they hear what I'm saying, they will hear, and they will respond, and they will come to me. So here you have the Greeks 
uh, who uh, who know almost nothing uh, whatever little bit they have heard they've begun to respond to that and they are coming so now it is time for the shepherd to lay down his life for the sheep because the true sheep are coming they're getting attracted to him and it is now time for him to uh, you know lay down his life for them uh, so uh, at this point of time uh, when there is the contrast between the jewish people uh, the jewish leaders who are not responding and the gentiles who are responding and eagerly coming forward at the in that moment jesus says now the hour has come uh, and uh, we see paul touching upon this later on you know um, in his writings he talks about how the gentiles have been eager to come and enter enter into the kingdom you know to 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 come to the lord on the other hand um, the 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 people of god the chosen ones the israelites have not um, shown any interest and uh, of course paul says a day will come and they too a remnant of israel also will come back to the lord he does talk about that but over here uh, we see that it's the gentiles who take the first step forward and they are eager to come into the kingdom uh, you know which is why it even says in another place those who are really eager they are you not know, taking the coming into the kingdom by force um, they are violently taking hold of what is being offered to them so there's an eagerness that we see among the gentile community because they are also true sheep and they are hearing his voice and they are being attracted to him okay so um so let's move on uh, to verses 23 to 26 uh, where jesus talks about uh, you know his um, glorification uh, well, if someone could read out 23 to 26, please. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Yes. So um, Jesus is now aware that he must lay down his life for his sheep. And uh, so he talks, uh, now he uses the imagery of a, um, of a kernel of wheat, which falls into the ground. And uh, so only if he dies, only if he makes his sacrifice, then through him, you know, many will, will be uh, saved, many lives will be saved. And so he uh, talks about that and he expects his followers also to follow the same, um, you know, example. They, he expects them also to live in the same way. And so he says, in the same way he has chosen not to love his life, but to lay it down, they also must be willing to um, lay down their lives and the wording that is used over here he says anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it so it's very clear over here we are not being asked to hate our lives not at all we are asked we just only being asked to hate our life in this world in the sense um, place the eternal things first place the temporary things next uh, because if, if we see in the Gospels, in many places where this word hate is used, it's not talking about hatred as such. It's talking more about your priorities. You know, in what way are you ordering your priorities? What comes first and what comes next? Uh, because that's what we see, right? Even in Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 26 and verse 27. Um, because over there you have the same... Um, thought being expressed if someone could actually read out that please uh, Luke 14 26 to 27 If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
and verse 27. Answer. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, so uh, it's the same thought that is being expressed over here. There are things that you're expected to hate. And uh, then, you know, by doing that, you would be taking up your cross and following him and you would be his disciple. So you would have to hate um, your own family and you would have to hate even their own life, it says. Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot, uh, yeah, anyone who loves uh, these things more than me, uh, they would not be a disciple of mine is what it says over here. So obviously we know, right? It's not, uh, Jesus is not saying that we should hate our family members. So the word hate is being clearly used over here in the sense of what are your priorities? So your first priority must be the Lord. Next will come your family members. And then maybe after that will come your own uh, life. You know, So uh, there's a order in which uh, you would need to place your priorities uh, with, with God coming first. All right. So uh, in that sense, uh, Jesus talks about how we should hate our life in this world because it's a temporary thing. On the other hand, we should value our eternal life, the life which we are going to be having for um, billions of centuries. You know, once we uh, once we move away from this world, we are going to be uh, alive forevermore. And so we must love that rather than just love this temporary existence. So hate over here is again being used in the sense of priorities. We have to have the correct priorities. Um, all right. Uh, sh we can maybe, if, if you could have someone read out verses 27 to 30, please. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But, this, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered others. An angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Yes. Uh, and so uh, Jesus says over here, um, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And it says so clearly in 29, the people hear it. And uh, some of them are able to grasp what is being said. But to others, it sounds just like thunder or uh, like someone speaking, though and they're not sure what is being said. And then Jesus says, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. And so this is the third time where you have uh, the father audibly testifying to Jesus saying that this is my son I he he has been sent by me okay so um, the first of course was at the baptism uh, where um, you know the voice comes and says I am well pleased this is my son so um, that would be the first time the second uh, is the transfiguration when you don't really have the crowd watching and here in the third instance uh, the crowd actually hears the voice um, where Jesus is, uh, where, where the Father is confirming that Jesus is indeed from Him, and He will glorify Himself through Jesus. Um, uh, we, I think, uh, the next uh, few verses are important for us, you know, doctrinally. Uh, so, uh, thirty-one to thirty-three, if someone could read out, and maybe we could, you know, kind of look at it in greater detail. Thirty-one to thirty-three. Now is the judgment of this world. Now we will rule the, now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Yeah. Um, so Jesus says first, you know, Father, glorify your name. And over here in 31, he says, now is the time for judgment on this world. So um, looking at this whole uh, crucifixion through human eyes, it looks like as if uh, rather than being glorified, uh, you know, if the Father and Jesus are being defeated uh, because uh, Jesus is going to be dying. And then uh, again, if you look at it through human eyes, it looks like as if Jesus is getting judged on the cross because uh, he's, you know, um, he, he is being um, punished. It looks as though he is being punished. But 
when we look at it uh, through the eyes of God, uh, through the eternal plan that God had, uh, we see uh, this entire crucifixion um, story in, in a very different light. So we see that it's not defeat that's happening here, but rather um, amazing glorification. Uh, because there's going to be a very great victory which is going to be won. And it's not Jesus who is being judged, rather it is the prince of this world who is being judged and he would be uh, driven out. So uh, there's a contrast. Um, um, someone was about to say something? Did someone speak up? Okay, all right. Yeah, in Matthew 27, you know, verses 41 to 43, uh, we have the teachers of the law and the elders. They are mocking and they are Jesus when he's on the cross. And they say uh, he saved others, but he can't save himself. You know, he says that he's the king of Israel. Uh, so if he's the king of Israel, you know, let him come down from the cross, they say. Uh, in fact, in uh, Matthew 27, verse 43, they say, uh, you know, he, he says that he trusts in God. So let God rescue him now if he wants him, because he says that he's the son of God, right? So if he's the son of God, then God should save him. So in human eyes, it looked as if um, Jesus was being condemned, that Jesus was being judged. Uh, but in reality, what does Jesus say over here regarding this incident, this event? He says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. So um, it is the judgment is not coming upon uh, Jesus. Rather, the judgment is coming upon the evil one, the prince of this world, the devil. OK, so um, uh, how would we um, reconcile that? with the fact that Jesus did take our punishment and did take our judgment upon himself. Um, if we look at uh, you know, uh, Galatians 3, uh, verses 10 to 14, it talks about how Jesus became a curse for us. OK, so Jesus did become a curse for us in the sense we were under the curse because we had not been able to keep the law in all of its you know completion um even if a person is able to keep maybe 75 percent of the laws in uh, in a sincere manner they would uh you know uh, stumble over the rest uh, so nobody has been able to perfectly keep the law and so we are all under a curse and uh, so jesus took our curse upon himself uh, so in that sense, Jesus did become a curse. And um, so the judgment which should have come upon us came upon him instead. Um, where would we see that um, in? Uh, in 1 John 4, 10, it says, um, in, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation basically means that someone needs to be propitiated. Someone needs to be appeased. They are very, very angry. They have wrought this upon, upon that person. But you are giving a propitiation, a, an appeasement to calm that person down, uh, to, you know, to please them and satisfy their anger so that they will no longer be angry. So God prepares a propitiation for himself through Jesus so that his anger and wrath uh, will uh, not be directed upon humanity. So Jesus does become a curse for us. Um, Jesus does become a propitiatory offering for us that God's anger and judgment will be satisfied. Um, however, the one who actually gets judged and defeated is not Jesus in any sense of the word. Because we have all these silly teachings which go around, right? Where they say, oh, Jesus went to hell. And then uh, you know the father had to come and save him from there. And uh, all kinds of wild theories. So please let us get this very, very straight. Um, the curse which was on us, he took it upon him. The judgment which should come upon us, he took it on him. Uh, in the sense, the punishment which should come upon us, he took it upon him. But the one that actually got judged is the prince of this world, the, e the evil one, the devil. He's the one who gets defeated. And um, he's the one who is 
um, completely crushed over here in this event. So it is not Jesus who is uh, in any way condemned by the Father. All right. So we we should uh, that would be a kind of wrong uh, teaching. So we should be careful how we uh, you know um, how we think about this particular passage. It's important. Um, it's not Jesus who got judged. Jesus took our judgment, but it's the evil one who did get judged. All right. I just wanted to make that point. Uh, clear uh, because Colossians 2 I think yeah that's mentioned in your textbook it's, it talks about Colossians 2 14 to 15 uh, where it says yeah maybe we should actually look at that if uh, and we'll you know we'll just close with that uh, for our first session if someone could please read out Colossians 2 14 to 15 because there it talks about how the evil one is judged uh, yeah Colossians 2, 14 to 15, please. By cancelling the rec record of debt that stood against us with its hmm. legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He hmm. disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by hmm. triumphing over them in him. Yeah. yeah. So it's like as if all our, um, all the lack all the shortcomings you know all the laws which we have been unable to uh, fulfill so it's like a long list is there of our legal indebtedness that's what it says in verse 14 so this is long list of legal indebtedness saying you know this law has been broken this law has not been met these requirements have not been fulfilled this is long list and jesus takes that entire list he nails it to the cross and he is declaring, you know, I am paying, going to pay the price for all these broken laws. I will take the punishment for all these broken laws. And the, and so the legal indebtedness which we owe, which uh, we have been unable to fulfill, Jesus fulfills on our behalf. He takes the punishment for us. And once he takes the punishment for us, we now stand forgiven. So because now we are forgiven, um, we are no longer under a debt and the evil one no longer has any legal authority to go on controlling us because now we are free. We have been set free by Jesus. We are no longer slaves who are indebted. We are no longer debtors. We have been set free. So they no longer have any hold over us. The evil powers and no longer have any hold over us because we are not in debt anymore. Our debt has been completely wiped out taken care of by Jesus and therefore these evil powers who used to have a hold upon us they now stand defeated they have no hold over us any longer and it says in 15 having disarmed them so Jesus has literally disarmed them they have no actual weapons against us so if we stand in the name of Jesus and claim our victory they actually technically have no weapon to use against us. They would have to admit and their defeat and say, yes, we stand defeated because on that day we were disarmed. So verse 15, it says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So indeed, just like Father Jesus says, Father, you know, uh, be glorified. And then um, um, the, the Father responds and says, I have been glorified and I will glorify myself again. All of that indeed is a reality. It did take place because on in that you know event of the cross, the evil one and his followers uh, were all defeated completely, and we are no longer under their control and hold because we are no longer in debt. We have been completely set free. So something very glorious and wonderful took place um, on our behalf at the cross. So uh, those are the thoughts which um, you know are contained in that phrase where it says that judgment has now come upon the prince of the world. Okay, so um, we'll uh, take a break now because it's nine fifty. So at ten o'clock we will again come and rejoin. Um, and if you have any doubts, you know, which you would like to raise regarding these things which we talked about just now, uh, maybe you could raise those doubts when we come back from our break. So thank you. <laughs>